Well, it's time to look at the SNP's sordid school sex survey. This has been in the news for quite a while now, and it's time to have a look at what's in it and at our response to it. So I'm going to look at the content of the survey, go through the relevant questions and offer some critique. I'm going to look at what Nicola Sturgeon had to say in the Parliament when she was challenged about this. I'm going to look at the response of other people in general uh, in the media. And finally, I'm going to pose a question, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. And that is, why has there been such a fuss over this questionnaire while the sex education resources are 10 times worse? And yet they seem completely taboo. No one in the media, no politicians will touch them. But this questionnaire, for some reason, has become a, a bit of a, a public mainstream political issue. But anyway, let's see what's in it. Um, so this is the version for 15-year-olds upwards, the senior phase one. So here we go. Question 48. Do you currently have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Yes, no, prefer not to say. I mean, my first response is that people should be saying basically none of your business. Why does the school, why does the government uh, need to know that? It's also an example of the the school or the state sort of usurping the role of parents. That's the sort of thing parents should be involved in, should be aware of rather than the state wanting to know. Um, and the other thing that this question might do, it might upset some people. Someone might think, for example, no, I haven't got a girlfriend. All my friends have. I really wish I have. I haven't had. I haven't got one. So that might be a, you know, a little bit upsetting uh, as well. But anyway, that's the first question. Not a particularly big deal, but some issues with it. Right, question 50. People have varying degrees of sexual experience. How much, if any, sexual experience have you had? Right, first box, none. Next one, small amount, kissing, some intimate touching on top of clothes. Next one, some experience, but no sexual intercourse, e.g. touching intimately underneath clothes or without clothes on. Next one, more experiences, including oral sex. Next one, uh, vaginal or anal sex. Next one, prefer not to say. Right, so a pupil reading that, thinking about those options, what does it communicate to them? Well, part of it, what it might communicate is, well, if you're in the non brackets, you really are sort of at the extreme of the distribution. You're a bit unusual. I mean, none at all, when there's all these other categories as well. The other thing, people with the non, they might be thinking, or very likely be thinking, what am I missing out on? There's all these other things as well. that They're assuming there's lots of other young people are doing. Maybe I'm missing out. It's communicating an expectation that pupils are going to be engaging in a lot of these activities. And to pick up on the point you probably noticed as well, it stands out, vaginal or anal sex. Okay, why is the SNP obsessed with anal sex when it comes to education and uh, messages to uh, school children? Well, this is a consequence of their LGBT inclusive education policy. Because if you say your education is going to be LGBT inclusive, if you just talk about vaginal sex, you have to talk about anal sex at the same time. Because if you didn't do that, that would be heteronormative. That would be exclusive. That would be alienating of homosexuals. It would be discriminating against uh, the homosexual community. You see the same approach when we look at the sex education resources when it comes to how to make babies. I mean, having sexual intercourse, a man and a woman, um, and then having a child, that's just one way among many. So, of course, that's not the way that, uh, for example, two gay men have a child. And so artificial reproductive techniques are given equal billing to heterosexual intercourse. And the reason is that it's in order to achieve LGBT equality. That's the Scottish government's policy. So this, the way that whenever they mention vaginal sex, almost always anal sex has to be mentioned along with it. That's because of LGBT inclusive education, a policy that went through the parliament without a single MSP objecting to it. So um, I think a lot of people have objected to this questionnaire. What they're really thinking is they really don't like the fact that it's mentioned in anal sex that they might find distasteful, uh, at least, for example. And that's what they're really thinking. That's really why people are objecting to it. But often people don't quite know how to put that into words. So they don't say that. So they say other things instead. I'm going to talk about that more later in the uh, video. 
So these issues are obviously very sensitive, potentially embarrassing information. And when pupils fill this questionnaire, they put in their Scottish candidate number, which does identify them. So on a database will be this information and it will be identifiable. They will be identifiable to it as well, which I think is a, a significant risk uh, for any person. I think probably you or I, you'd think twice about putting such sensitive information in any sort of government database. I'm not sure the young people have been warned adequately about that. Right, is this useful information? Is it helpful for the government and therefore, well, I assume they publish the results, anyone else in Scotland as well, to know this information? Is it useful? Well, potentially, depending on how it's going to be used, it could be useful information to know. On the other hand, it's like with medical um, investigations, there might be something you want to know about a part of the body, but the procedure of finding it out might be so distressing and damaging that you think, well, actually, it's best not to know rather than to uh, impose that procedure on the patient. Same here. This could potentially be interesting information to know. It could be useful. But is it worth the price you pay through asking the, these questions to every uh, child in Scotland? Probably not. Anyway, moving on. Uh, right, question 49. Does your current boyfriend, girlfriend do any of these things? Please tick one of the boxes in each line. So this is basically coming from the sort of abusive relationship theory, if you like. So they're trying to induct young people to be aware of signs of abusive relationships. But let's see what they've got here. So your boyfriend or girlfriend makes you feel safe and respected. So you might think about your current partner or spouse. Do they make you feel safe? And what does that even mean? They occasionally make you feel safe. Does that make mean they make you feel unsafe at the other side at other times feel respected so it's a bit hard to interpret that so i'm not sure the result of that is really very meaningful at all next one encourages you to do something you enjoy okay i mean maybe they just assume that you're going to do things you enjoy when you want to in any case that do boyfriends and girlfriends need to encourage you to go and do things that you enjoy but you can imagine when these results are in if someone says you know, my girl, my boyfriend occasionally encourages me to do things that I enjoy, then that will probably be taken to mean that there's some sort of problem, that boyfriends in general, they've been a bit controlling or, or, or whatever. I don't know. Well, next one. Constantly checks where you are. Then you can tick a box. So you can tick the box saying that your boyfriend occasionally, constantly checks where you are. Okay. Again, this is extremely unclear, potentially incoherent even. Um, so uh, again, uh, the answer to this question will be taken as evidence, again, that it will be boyfriends in particular, are controlling of girlfriends. But can we really learn much from a question that that's, a a question that that's vague? I'm not sure we can. Right, puts you down when you're together or in front of people. Again, that could potentially be a real problem. On the other hand, you know, maybe someone's a bit of a show off. Maybe they need just deflating a little bit. Maybe their ego uh, does need uh, that pricking at some points when they're with other people. So uh, again, very subjective, but you can see the line is to try and provide evidence that even boyfriend, girlfriend relationships at school are you know, potentially abusive or there's an element of abusiveness uh, in them. Right, how about this one? Comments negatively on how you dress. Now, I thought about when my wife was my girlfriend. Did she comment negatively on how I dressed? She did. Time and time again. She would say, you're not wearing that. Or what on earth are you wearing? Can you? Oh, that's awful. And sorry. It's... Right, I'm OK again now. But obviously, that can be very distressing. Now, you can see that there is potentially... A problem in someone, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, being bossy about what the uh, the other one wears, potentially. But also, it could be perfectly reasonable. Uh, tries to limit the time you spend with friends. Yeah, again, very vague, possibly could be a problem. Puts pressure on you to do sexual things. Now, again, what does that mean, pressure? I mean, probably in a lot of relationships uh, with young people of this age, with the current culture that we live in, um, that yes, boys will be asking girls uh, for sexual 
activity. Okay, and now what is that classed as pressure or not? Who knows what the definition of, of pressure is? But again, this is going to be presented as evidence of sort of abusive relationships. And again, I would be amazed if it's not presented in the context of boyfriends being a particular uh, problem. Um, so uh, then that whole section is a bit dubious. It's very vague. You can see exactly what they're trying to find. Inevitably, this will produce evidence that's going to be used to say there's a problem with abusive relationships. Therefore, we need to have even more lessons about that, which generally take a sort of feminist slant as well. And the implication will probably be that boyfriends are bad and, and girls tend to be the victims. But anyway, moving on. Uh, the most recent time you had vaginal or anal sex, penetrative sex, did you or the other person use a condom? So again, you see that same old thing. They've got to be equated. You can't mention, mention vaginal sex without anal sex because they've got to be LGBT uh, inclusive. Right. The most recent time you had penetrative vaginal sex, did you or the other person use anything to pre prevent pregnancy? OK, you know, fair enough. But people writing this question now, the Scottish government, their ideal is basically if the kids are having any sort of sexual activity that's just absolutely fine so long as they're taking precautions that's the main thing that's the ultimate goal is that they're you know, using a condom using contraception that's their philosophy i mean the emotional harms etc caused by young promiscuous sex are really uh, not mentioned at all right another question have you had vaginal or anal sex penetrative sex more than once and i don't really know why they need to ask that when they've already asked very similar questions anyway yes no prefer not to say but we've just got to bear in mind this is the school or the government you can look at it either way asking imagine your son and daughter that question i think if anyone parents generally if they were to be there when their child were to be asked those questions they would object in the strongest possible terms they wouldn't give the child the opportunity to answer they would say to people, anyway, how dare you ask that? That's highly inappropriate. I don't want that discussing with my child at all, you know, particularly you know, with an adult that they, they don't know. So they can ask him the questions. It breaks down a barrier. It removes inhibition. So after this questionnaire, if you're a boy thinking, oh, basically, I'd really like to persuade my girlfriends to have anal sex, then this questionnaire would make you think, yeah, that seems quite a normal thing to do because that they seem to be expecting that's what we do. And the girl who might be thinking, Ugh, no, I don't want to do that. No way. She'll be thinking, oh, well, well, it seems quite normal, though. It seems like you know, that's what lots of people do. That, that's what my teachers, that's what the school, that's what the government thinks is quite normal. So it will embolden the boy, for example, in this case, and it will undermine uh, the girl. All right, next question. How old were you when you had sex for the first time? 13 years or younger, 14, 15, 16 or older, uh, don't know, prefer not to say. Now, with these questions, it says, if there's a need to follow up on something, if a concern emerges and there's a need to follow up, then they will, if they're concerned for your safety or, or whatever. So if someone first had sex at 13 or younger, right, well, that is something, if it's younger than 13, that would definitely be prosecuted by the police, uh, usually. Um, 13, 14, 15, that is illegal as well. I know the policy is not to prosecute if the age gap is small, but it is technically illegal. So it's like saying to young people, tell us about illegal things that you did. Obviously, don't ex expect that we're going to do anything about it. We accept that you do illegal things. It's no problem. It'd be like having a question, you know, have you stolen uh, sweets or chocolate from a local shop uh, in the last week? And the, the kids think, okay, I can tick yes. And I know full well, that nothing's going to happen. So in other words, the Im implication is the school doesn't really care. The government doesn't really care. They accept that, okay, these things happen. We're not really bothered. And that's the message that's effectively coming through here. The illegal underage sex is fine. It's really fine. Which is the message of the sex education. I mean, they talk about basically their right to have illegal underage sex. I mean, how that makes sense, I don't know. I mean, it makes no sense, obviously. But that's the, uh, the philosophy behind it all. Right, a couple of questions to go. When you first had sex, would you personally say you wanted it to happen earlier? You wanted it to happen at that time. You would rather have had it later. 
You didn't ask yourself that or prefer not to say. Now, I expect the thinking behind this question is they're hoping that a majority will say they'd rather have had sex for the first time later. Now, um, I, I would say that would be a, a sort of noble ambition. It would be good if the government's wanting to present that message. And it is probably what they're uh, wanting to say. So fair enough there. But what would be much more interesting is if they looked at all the results from these questionnaires and look, for example, the earlier someone had sex for the first time, how does that play out in their well-being questions? I'm not talking about those in this video. I'm not going to talk about those in another video. But the questions about, you know, their mental health, how happy, how positive are you? What's the correlation between, um, you know, early sex or various sorts of sexual activity and mental well-being? That would be very interesting to know, wouldn't it? Will they use the results to find that out? They won't. I suspect that they won't. Um, even if they did that, a problem with it would be, be too short term because the negative effects tend to come out in the longer term. Right, last question. Which of the following best describes you? Please tick uh, one circle on each line. I find it easy to say no to having sexual experiences I don't want. Now, if someone clicks totally disagree with that, I mean, will that mean that the social workers will come to see them? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's quite difficult, isn't it? I, I mean, I think that would be quite a concern, but maybe they don't find it easy to say no, but they do actually say no. So it, it's not really a good question. If they want to ask a question to see whether or not there needs to be an intervention, the question needs to be, do you engage in sexual activities that you actually don't want to? That would be the clear cut question that would ring alarm bells. So I'm not quite sure how useful this is going to be. Anyway, I find it easy to ask for help regarding sexual health issues. I find it easy to get information on sexual health. Well, the answer to those questions has got to be yes and yes, because there's reams of information on the internet available in any school. They can go to the doctor. There'll be people in the school they can approach. But inevitably, the results won't be 100% yes, 100% yes. So it will be taken as evidence that it needs to be even more of the sort of sex education uh, that's going on in Scottish schools at the moment. And the last question, I find it easy to say what I want in relationships. Again, it's so vague and woolly, I'm not sure we'll really learn anything useful uh, from that. Now, there's lots more to this questionnaire. Some of it pries into family life in a very intrusive manner, but I'm going to save that for the next video. And uh, you can learn about that in a few days. So that's what's in the questionnaire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, parents have contacted me and my colleagues as they are concerned about the explicit nature of some of the questions. One of the questions asks, people have varying degrees of sexual experience. How much, if any, sexual experience have you had? Non-small amount, for example, kissing, some intimate touching on top of clothes, some experiences, but no sexual intercourse, for example, touching intimately underneath clothes or without clothes on, or more experiences, including oral sex, vaginal or anal sex. There has also been reports that the supposed anonymous questionnaires can be traced back to individual pupils, as they must enter their student candidate number twice, that is directly linked to their name. First Minister, would you feel comfortable answering these questions, and can you reassure Parliament today that should a young person complete these forms, they cannot be identified? First Minister. Well, firstly, on the issue of confidentiality, the questionnaires have been specially designed so that the information provided by children and young people is used for statistical and research purposes only, um, and that ensures that any results of the research or resulting statistics will uh, not uh, be made available in a form which identifies individual children um, and young people. Uh, let me repeat uh, what I said earlier on. Uh, this is a voluntary survey. It is only for S4, secondary uh, year four and uh, upwards. Uh, any parent can uh, refuse to give consent and, of course, uh, any young person can opt not to take part in the survey or to skip particular questions in the survey. It is not mandatory. But I come back to the fundamental point. Uh, we can choose to pretend that young people of this age group do not have uh, the experiences uh, that the member has narrated or is not exposed online uh, in the digital world uh, we live in. Uh, we can choose to pretend uh, that young people, girls sometimes in particular, 
are not subjected to harassment and pressure uh, around sexual matters. Uh, we can do that. We can refuse to ask the questions so that we don't know the answers, or we can get the answers that then allows us to better support young people, to provide the advice and the information and the guidance to young people that supports and enables them to make positive, healthy choices uh, for the future. I do choose the latter, and I would ask the Conservatives seriously and others, yes, to engage in any uh, legitimate concerns uh, around these matters, but don't whip up concern on the part of parents for completely unnecessary reasons. And let us all focus on what really matters, supporting our young people to make healthy choices in their own lives. So that was new Conservative MSP Megan Gallagher asking the question. So well done to her for uh, bringing that up. I would say momentum had already grown around this issue before the Conservatives brought it up in the Parliament. They didn't sort of jump on the issue and make it uh, make the case themselves. It did gather momentum. And then uh, a Conservative asked the, uh, the question. Notice there the way she asked it. You hear this so often in the Parliament. Parents are concerned. I was reading something, Kate Forbes talking about transgender stuff in schools as well recently. And again, she said, some parents are concerned. They get in touch and they're concerned. OK, that's a fair enough point to make. I sometimes feel, though, that what we need from MSPs is not for them to say, some parents are concerned. We need them to say, this is wrong. I believe this is wrong. This shouldn't be happening. Because it can almost sound as if they're trying to distance themselves from the parents. So, OK, you know, you might think the parents are old fashioned or whatever, but, you know, I'm just passing on their concerns. Obviously, I, I'm not uh, don't have those views, but some people are concerned. So I think it's really important for MSPs. This is what Scottish Family Party MSPs will do. They won't just be saying some other people are concerned and we're just passing the message on. We will be saying and we think this is wrong. This needs to change. And this is why this is harming young people. So whether parents are concerned or not, this is wrong. So anyway, Nicola Sturgeon's answer was, she obviously doesn't answer the question, obviously. She won't bring herself to use the words in the questionnaire. Okay, She would not want herself on camera having to come out with the phrases in the questionnaire, so she doesn't uh, use them. She talks about pressure on girls. It'd have to be girls. It's always going to be gendered with Nicola Sturgeon. But as I've said already, I think this questionnaire will make that issue worse. Girls will feel more under pressure to engage in sexual activity because of the normalising effect of this questionnaire. I mean, Nicola Sturgeon talking about helping young people to make positive, healthy choices. Sex education resources do completely the opposite. Now, Nicola Sturgeon gives the wrong impression about identifying individual pupils. Obviously, in the published research, pupils are not going to be named or be identifiable, but it's quite clear in the documentation that it says if um, if a concern is apparent in a pupil's answers, so I've talked about some of those possibilities, haven't I, so far on the video, that it may be that social work or the police or whatever, or, or maybe the school are going to be alerted to that, and they will follow up that issue with an individual pupil. Okay, so they are identifiable through it, and action may be taken as a result of that. So my big question, why is it that within the mainstream media or within mainstream politics, this questionnaire has become you know, quite a bit of an issue. I mean, the Herald seems to have run story after story on it. Not always got anything new to say, but they just seem to do headline after headline. They've realised it, it gets a lot of clicks on the internet or whatever. But how come all this attention for this? But then the RSHP sex education resources, which are far, far worse, far, far more concerning in my view, just can't get a mention. They're completely taboo. I mean, look at this uh, again. There's this equating of, of sort of natural sexual intercourse that are, uh, you know, a loving act and also uh, creates new life. And it's just equated with anal sex, which is physically damaging in many cases. Um, it's very likely to transmit uh, diseases. Just to say, these medical problems with anal sex, I believe they're being downplayed very significantly. Now, you may think, surely the medical profession couldn't be steered by ideological campaigners. Surely they're not pressurised by these sort of political and social factors. Well, the answer is that, yes, that very definitely can happen, uh, as you can see. And I believe it is happening in this case as well. And also there's a case of anal sex 
that a lot of people would regard it as degrading or even uh, immoral. Yet in the Scottish Government, Sex Education Resources, this is a video to be played to uh, young people of this age group, anal sex is actually sort of recommended as being better. There's also anal sex, which is the insertion of a penis or a dildo into a partner's rectum. Though it's the primary form of sex among gay men, its popularity has surged among straight couples. A 2008 survey found that 44% of straight men and 36% of straight women have had anal sex. Your anus and surrounding area have a lot of nerve endings, including the pudendal nerve, which controls muscles in your external anal sphincter and carries sensations to the anus, penis, and clitoris. In men, penetration can stimulate the glandular organ known as the prostate. Though there's no published laboratory research, anecdotal evidence suggests that prostate orgasms are more powerful and pleasurable than penile-induced ones. For women, anal penetration can stimulate the perennial sponge, which sits between the vaginal opening and rectum, so pressure can result in pleasure and orgasm. And then we've got also the, the uh, teaching about so-called rimming, licking the anus. So pupils of this age are taught about that at school by their teachers. I mean, it's just appalling. So I, I believe that these things, people are repelled by them. They find them very distasteful or even disgusting, morally wrong. But maybe people are not very confident to explain why. They feel that they haven't got a logical case to make against them, so they won't say. Um, but just to try and illustrate what's going on here. I mean, some people have a, a sort of sexual activity of sort of urinating on each other. Okay. Now, if I were to say to you, what's wrong with that? Could you explain what's wrong with that? You'd maybe just say, it's disgusting, it's degrading, it's far removed from natural sexual intercourse and procreation. But maybe you think, oh, are they really very logical reasons? I would encourage you to say that they are absolutely good reasons. They are perfectly good reasons to express disapproval of a sexual practice. But what's happening with this questionnaire? is I believe a lot of people are repelled by the anal sex references, but they don't really know how to say that. So instead, they object to other aspects of it, which keep them on safer ground. So they'll talk about data protection, etc. But why no comments about the sex education and a huge fuss about the questionnaire? If you've got any ideas about that, I'd love to hear them. Put it in the, uh, the comments below. I mean, here's an analogy of the situation that we're in. It's as though if schools were teaching children, you know, drugs, if you want to take drugs, that's absolutely fine. Experiment, try out which ones suit you. These are the best sort of drugs to take. You know, we're perfectly okay with that. And the response from the public, from the media, from the politicians is, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's perfectly, uh, perfectly good education. Sounds fine to us. But then the government does a questionnaire in schools saying, have you taken drugs? And people say, oh, horrible, this is appalling. How could they do such a terrible thing asking a question like that in schools? You think, hang on a minute, that's crazy. Surely the more serious issue is that they're basically recommending to children or inviting them to experiment with drugs, telling them which ones are best. That's the real issue. When they then ask them whether or not they're acting on the advice that they've been given in school, well, that's the secondary issue. But that's the situation we've got with the sex education and the sex survey in Scotland. Right, so, I mean, that's just another case of, of the uh, the SNP being driven along by people with, I would suggest, a very dubious uh, sexual values, um, but that's they're just completely dominating what's taught in schools and what's going on in schools. So there's another video coming about the other aspects of this questionnaire. Just before I finish, just to mention again, the council elections coming up soon. If you've got any interest in uh, being a candidate for the Scottish Family Party, you'd like to explore that, do email our chairman, Michael Willis, uh, email him at chairman at scottishfamily.org, chairman at scottishfamily.org, and you could join in our online training sessions, which are now underway. If you're not a member of the Family Party, do please join. There's a link below, and thanks for watching.